Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. The headlines are clear. Religion is on the decline in America as many people leave behind traditional religious practices. According to tonight's guest, however, religion isn't dying. There's just a major transformation occurring in how people understand and experience God. Diana Barbas is a leading commentator on religion, politics and culture and the author of nine books on American religion. In her latest book, Grounded, Finding God in the World, A Spiritual Revolution, she explains how this shift from a vertical understanding of God to a God found on the horizons of nature and human community is at the heart of the spiritual revolution that surrounds us and that is challenging not only religious institutions but political and social ones as well. Diana Butler-Bass, welcome. Hi Sandy, it's great to be with you. I'm glad you made it, Diana. We've had uh, a number of uh, problems, I know, but hopefully tonight's show will go very smoothly. So, in your book, Grounded, you write that faith is no longer a matter of mountaintop experience or institutional practice. Instead, people are finding new spiritual ground by discovering and embracing God everywhere in the world around us, in the soil, the water, the sky, in our homes and neighbourhoods, and in the global common. common. When did this first start becoming apparent to you? Well, I think that I actually first noticed this shift when I was fairly young, maybe a college student, and I was reading in the Christian mystical tradition, and I found there this beautiful literature and prayer sort of material that wasn't about a God that was far away in heaven, but instead was about a God that was very intimate, a God that was close to us. And I've always loved the mystical tradition. So for me, it's been something that's been empowering for a long time. But in terms of a, of a trend, I, I think that one of the things that helped me to notice it most is not just, you know, some quirky people who happen to like the mystical tradition, but it was through my own daughter uh, when she was young. Uh, she's she's just turning 20 this month, and she would always go to church with us, and she didn't have particular problems with it, and she liked it, but she never really seemed to respond to it at a really deep level, and one time we were having a conversation, and I asked her, I said, well, honey, where do you find God? And she said, when I'm hiking. And it was something about that conversation that I had with her when she was, I think she was probably 10. And um, it just sort of opened my eyes. And I realized that all around me, there were a lot of people who were tired of church and they were tired of traditional liturgies. And uh, they couldn't really connect to the idea of a far off God who exists in the sky above us. Uh, but instead, we're reimagining and, and understanding God as being here with us in our lives, very intimate, very personal uh, vision of God. And I, so as a scholar, I just started reading widely and paying attention to the sort of the languages of spirituality that are all around us. And I think that in the last 20 years, there's just been um, an incredible amount of interest in this idea of relocating our spiritual lives and relocating our spiritual interests to being nearby rather than just interested in a god that saves us after we die so so i i i've had a long-term interest here um but it was my daughter who began to help me spot it as something that was a wider cultural trend well for many years there's been a, a massive divide a divide between organized religion and uh, so-called new age spiritual philosophies and now what you're describing in your book there's more of a coming together 
um, people, more people who would describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. I mean, what do you think, you know, beyond, um, beyond things like, you know, just people having been frustrated with the dogma, the restrictions, the re- rigidity, maybe even the blatant hypocrisy of some religions and uh, some church leaders. What do you think is actually causing this shift, this spiritual revolution as you describe it? Well, I I think there's a lot of sources for it. Um, I think science is one of the sources. Um, for centuries in Western culture, we had this idea that the structure of the universe was a vertical structure where there were three sort of main tiers to the universe. There was heaven, earth, and then hell, whatever that was, the underground beneath our feet. And that structure of the universe, that three-tiered universe, philosophers believed that was the actual structure of the universe. Scientists believed that was the actual physical structure of the universe. And so theology and um, church life in Western culture organized itself around this hierarchical, three-tiered, vertical idea of reality. And then, of course, we get to the 20th century, and that vertical structure of the universe is completely upended uh, by quantum physics. And the whole idea of a vertical structure dissolves when Einstein presents the idea of something called time-space. And so instead of their universe being up and down, it's everywhere it's uh, it's actually hard to do on the phone <laughs> because i'm i'm kind of moving my arms to make a, a sort of a a pool of reality it's reality stretches out through time and space in this sort of spiral evolving reality and there is no up or down so it became impossible as the 20th century was going along to talk about a god who lived up above us because there is no real up. There's instead these two dimensions of space and time and how they interact and interplay with each other. And if we think about quantum physics and the Big Bang, the question, where is God, becomes a very interesting question because God is no longer above us. Rather, God is in the midst of this powerful, amazing, evolving creation. And that really changes everything um, in religion. And it's taken a lot of people quite a while to figure that out. And and one of the things I I think is sort of fascinating is that sort of conventional churches and conventional uh, Christian denominations still haven't quite got it. Uh, But there are congregations, congregations, that are local and very dynamic and vibrant. And um, I think that there are individual congregations and sort of spiritual practices that have even emerged in North American Christianity that are reaching for the new sense of how the universe is really structured, not just some mythological structure that we got sort of stuck with um, from ancient times and the Middle Ages. So I think that science has really, really changed things for us. And I think it's uh, science has actually opened up um, wisdom traditions and sort of ancient religious traditions in ways that are quite powerful and beautiful and probably closer to their original intentions uh, than, than they have been expressing over the last three or four or five centuries. So so I think it's a really exciting time where religion and spirituality have a possibility of having a better conversation if religious well, people care to have it fun. and if spiritual people aren't, um, you know, aren't so just disgusted <laughs> by some of the things that have happened in churches and with uh, theology that they don't want to have that conversation anymore. But I think there's a congruence here or a convergence that's very potentially exciting. Virgin. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good word. And, you know, another question is, what is God? Um, as you were speaking, I was reminded of a conversation I had back in the early 2000s um, when I was producing an online spiritual magazine and I had um, a NASA engineer who used to write a column, you know, about how, you know, latest discoveries were gelling with spiritual, you know, concepts. 
And he said to me that time was, you would ask a scientist, do you believe in God? And they'd say, no, don't be silly, I'm a scientist. He said, and then at that time he was finding, you ask a, you know, a scientist, do you believe in God? And he'd say, don't be silly, of course I do, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Well, I, th I think that's actually something we've seen. You know, it, it, we were talking about the last 20 years. As I think that these scientific discoveries of the early part of the 20th century, you know, it takes a long time for what um, scientists and mathematicians and philosophers are talking about to make its way through the culture. Um, but certainly more recently, a lot of people who aren't scientists, I'm not a scientist, um, but a lot of people have become more aware of the implications of all of this. And it's been, I find it really kind of delightful and surprising and beautiful and amazing uh, that there are so many scientists who are allowing for the role of mystery to just, just play a much larger sort of um, a place in their own personal lives. And I think as well in how they approach, you know, some of the questions that they have. So so that's an exciting development to me, and I love watching, like, all of the public television shows of the cosmos, and I really enjoy Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and just it's sort of that popular physics. Um, it helps open my imagination towards who God is and where God is and, and how we um, embrace God, and it makes me just love the world and love the universe all the more. And that's actually what I think God is, is that I think God is love. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with leading commentator on religion, politics, and culture, Diana Baxter, who's a woman in the world where finding God in the spiritual revolution. Go on and explain We'll be back in a few moments with more from Diana Butler. The future of Internet Radio is here. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts Program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. My name is Meera Batra, and this is How I Live United. Many families have come to America for a better life. I advocate for these families with United Way. United Way empowers them to see opportunities available. We help them get involved with their kids, schools, and network within the community. My name is Meera Batra. I help families see opportunity and succeed. I don't just wear this shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Diana Butler Bass in Grounded. You write about the shape of the current spiritual revolution and the relationship between traditional religions and emerging spiritual practices. Can you expand on that for us? Um, for the last uh, 15 years, I have been mostly writing about congregations. And I have been interested for a very long time in a sort of off-the-radar screen phenomenon in North America, and that is that liberal, some liberal congregations in North America were experiencing surprising vitality and a lot of, of new life. And that was not something that scholars anticipated, and it certainly is not something that the media ever reported on. So about 15 or so years ago, I started doing research 
on that. And I, I've got a couple grants along the way and did some of my early writing about those congregations. Now, how that how that connects with your question is is really interesting because that research showed me that congregations that were theologically sort of centrist or more open to very liberal congregations in the Christian tradition, that vitality was not necessarily coming from you know the theological perspective that they embraced or the minister that they had. But what was happening is that the people in the congregation were taking spiritual experience very seriously. And there was a lot of experimentation in these congregations with very rich uh, forms of spiritual practice, some of them from those mystical traditions in Christianity that I mentioned at the beginning. So I, I was so excited, you know, when I saw this, because here were whole groups of people in congregations who were uh, doing things like uh, contemplative prayer and um, practicing meditation in sort of the it's Christian guys and very interested in things like Franciscan spirituality or Benedictine prayer, these great, amazing, profoundly deep uh, forms of spiritual practice that have been long present in Christianity but often ignored um, it, by people in churches. You know, the people who usually practice those things were monks and nuns or people who were sort of uh, just especially spiritually alive, you know, as, as lay people. And it's usually been very disconnected from congregational life. And so here I was studying these churches, and lo and behold, I'd be in a room full of Methodists who were interested in contemplative prayer. And I think to myself, where in the world did these people come from? And um, so I, that's what a lot of my early writing was about. And it, this whole experience and all of the research that I did at that particular time really began to point me in this direction um, toward looking at the, the, the new kind of weaving together of these sort of deep uh, ancient wisdom traditions of Christianity, the biblical tradition, the theological traditions that are now being enlivened uh, by a sort of a reappropriation or a rediscovery of these classical uh, spiritual practices. And so one of the things that I think is happening literally um, all over the United States and and um, I've seen it quite a bit in Canada and Australia and some in the UK as well, is that when people pay attention to spiritual experience, their faith comes alive. And um, why wouldn't we think that was true? <laughs> you know, it, it's a, an exciting um, reality uh, for people in congregations to think, oh, it doesn't have to be just like my grandmother's faith. You know, th this can be my faith. And the ways in which Jesus experience that you know, sort of deep personal connection with the universe and with God, um, that's something that all people um, who are Christians can experience. And then, of course, my work has taken me more broadly. I've, I've spoken with um, Jewish organizations, and um, I've been involved with other kinds of sort of new thought groups. And it's really interesting that across the board in many different religious traditions, people are finding this path of personal experience um, this, of these spiritual practices is a path of deep renewal, not only for themselves, but for their, their traditions. Well, you know, the word religion, I mean, and religious, they, they're so loaded. I was looking it really at a dictionary, is. Yeah, a dictionary definition earlier, and, and one of them was a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects completely man-made then <laughs> you know i mean um, <laughs> completely well, man-made it's, it's it's sort of interesting cuz the original sort of definition the way the place we got got the word religion comes from religio which means to hold together or to bind together and wow. um it's i i think the, that has some real power to it because that if we think of religion as that sort of binding power, it is not a 
binding to doctrine or it's not supposed to be a dogma that binds us down so that we never feel free in our lives but the it's it's the it's the power to bind to one another the power to find our connections to the earth yeah. and to god and i think that original sense of religio um you know if we could regain that um there's life there and and i i fully understand and uh, the the tension between religion and spirituality i I've, I've written about that some i've actually gotten in trouble uh in some christian circles by talking about that uh with too much enthusiasm <laughs> because a lot of people who are in charge of institutions don't really want to hear about the tension between religion and spirituality. Um, but I've been pushing this subject, and I think that people are understanding more and more why it's important to really get some clarity around these terms and that it, very few people, I think, in Western culture right now want to say, yes, I want to join an institution with a constricting dogma that never lets me um, find who I really am deeply and instead insists that I have to put on some sort of form of piety um, in order to get to heaven. I don't know anybody who thinks that way, but yet institutions sometimes act as if people still, that's what people want. And, and institutions, they have to get over that or they're just not going to last. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, we mustn't forget that long before religion, you know, uh, people found God in different ways. They found God like your daughter, you know, um, in the trees, in the woods, in the forests, in, in the land, in, you know, tilling the earth, in growing their own food. Right. And that's what I try to sort of, in Grounded, I try to sort of reconnect us with those very basic understandings of of religion uh, in um one of the chapters I think it was the, it, it must be the chapter on the sky I actually sort of put myself imaginatively into the position of a, an ancient person under the stars at night and the reason <laughs> I had never really thought about doing that as I've mostly lived in cities my entire life. And so I've never really seen the stars. It wasn't until I was hiking with my daughter in Wyoming and I looked up, you know, one night and the sky in Wyoming is utterly dizzying with stars. I never knew that the sky looked like that until you're out in just the wilds of these really isolated places. And I, I realized when I was there that that, was, that, that that kind of experience was probably one of the first movements that humankind had. You know, as you, they walk outside and there's the stars at night. And someone probably just opened their arms with their hands, you know, raised and breathed the word God. And and that, to me, those really basic connections, those really basic kinds of experiences of encountering what is sacred and divine, that's the that's the starting place. That's the 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 seed, as it were, of a deep spiritual life, of life that can be cultivated um, towards both love and justice. Well, I would think that most of us would say that probably our first spiritual experience was something like that. I can remember, you know, every time I used to feel so expansive and, and connected to everything was when I was in a place of great beauty. You know, I'd go on the dark, Dartmoor Moors in England or I'd be at the ocean and I'd that expansiveness that you feel is what was connecting me and for me was a spiritual experience. Yeah, and and as we've become more urban, that kind of experience has become more limited. And, um, you know, people have to go and sort of seek those, ex many people have to go and seek those experiences in Western culture because we don't necessarily stand on the edge of the sea or we don't necessarily climb the mountain or we don't necessarily have a garden in our backyard where we're, you know, digging our hands in the soil and dealing with worms and the amazing sort of hummus of the earth, you know. Um, and so, but but in rural life, those were very, those are very common experiences. Um, it, it, so it, in the book, I talk about nature quite a, you know, that's the first half of the book. And for me, that is very profound and expansive. 
and one of the places we find God. But then in the second half of the book, I also try to um, bring us to the expansiveness that happens when we have a deep relationship with other human beings. Because I think that that kind of expansiveness and finding God with our neighbors and really being aware of the holiness of other human beings might be a path that urban people um, would be more able to just sort of access kind of on a daily basis. And, you know, and I think that sometimes when we're living in cities, we think other people are an annoyance. You know, there's too many cars or there's too many people on the subway. Um, but uh, you know, great, great uh, Christian theologian, the English theologian C.S. Lewis, said in the 1950s, this quote that I've never forgotten, he said that if we ever really saw other human beings for who they were, we would be tempted to fall down on our knees and worship them as angels. And that quote is trying to remind us, you know, that the the divine image is so powerful in all of us as human beings that being in relationship with one another, honoring the dignity of others, really serving other people is another point of expansiveness. And so finding God both in the stars and the sea and the, the beauty of the earth and finding God in our neighbor and through the lot, the common life that we build together, I think is a, a beautiful sort of vision of a sort of spirituality that can engage both in a deepening of our own souls, but also in uh, doing justice for both the earth and for um, people who are disadvantaged and unprivileged at this point in, in history. You see, now that's what excites me, because if you think about all the religions that divide us, when we take it to the, that level, it cannot help but unite us. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest is leading commentator of religion, politics, and culture, Diana Buxter, whose latest book, Grounded, Finding God in the World, explores the transformation that the world is how people understand and experience God, relocating him from heaven the cutting edge of conscious radio, Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. I'm Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family, and then, boom! Everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle to America and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, Diana Butler Bass. If you could see a copy of your book that I have, it is literally covered in pink um, post it notes because there are so <laughs> many things that actually excited me and you know made me want to ask you questions. But we can't cover them all. Now, you talked earlier about um, you know, part one of your book which covers the natural habitat and you've got three chapter titles, you know, Dirt, Water and Sky. There is one piece that really spoke to me, um, you know, as somebody who's never regarded myself as religious, but this really gave me an understanding of what you were, you know, explaining here. And that was the piece in the chapter on dirt 
where you had an encounter with Forrest Pritchard. I mean, you had lots of encounters with people that you relate. Could you just briefly, uh, if you can remember that encounter, tell us a little bit about some of the things he said, because they were pretty darn profound. Yeah, um, he he was a a writer, and he's a farmer here in uh, Virginia, where I happen to live. And um, when we were talking, I I told him I said, hey, I'm you know I'm writing this this uh, book about God in nature and um, um, food and faith. I think that was the way that I that I framed the conversation originally. And uh, he said, hmm, uh, he. Uh, I, I and I asked him and I said, Does religion play any role in your story? He he was actually one of the first ever uh far, organic farmers and grass fed beef farmers um in Virginia to sort of return to this ancient sort of practice of farming. And he, he says he said to me, uh, well, uh, not really. Um uh, not if you mean by church, you know. And then he told me that he had been raised as an Episcopalian and, and that um that just wasn't something he did much um any longer and so so i said well what do you mean you know not really and he said well you know because i'm not really maybe a church guy um, but farmers are very spirit spiritual people and then he went on and he related this story about how after he had restored the land on this this farm that his parents had passed on to him and the land was very corrupted because it had bad farming practices and was full of pesticides and he spent years cleaning literally uh the land so that he could have a different kind of farm and this one spring he goes out and the field is so lush in a way that he's never seen that field lush before and he sank down, you know, to his knees, and he literally pulled a handful of dirt up and covered his face, and then he kind of fainted back into the into the the beautiful grasses, and he felt like he was just one, you know, with it all, and um, he understood at a really profound level that he and the earth and the the spirit of God were all participants in this moment of food and life. And uh, I just, I, I remember standing there in the farmer's market while we're having this conversation and his face, you know, just lit up. And um, I thought, yeah, you know, I, I really, I really understand this. He, I think he went on and actually said something to the effect of like the earth speaks to me. And um, for, for my perspective i had been reading this amazing book by a theologian a christian theologian from british columbia and uh that uh book talks about how the earth is the body of god and so here was this sort of theological vision going through my mind from this very intelligent and very thoughtful very well argued book that i had just read about God's embodiment being the very creation that we're that we walk with all the time and then he comes out with this this story about how the earth speaks to him and and this moment of oneness that he really found with the earth and and so that story went in the book um because I think that farmers just know that you know it's something he said and people I know who are farmers a lot of them have been very distraught by the way that people treat the things they grow or when they're sort of forced towards industrial farming when they don't have a whole lot of options for their ground. The processes of industrial farming really are sort of isolate and remove the farmers from that kind of primal experience. And um, I think that there's a sort of spiritual longing around many of our conversations and experiences with food and the earth that we'll, we want to get back to something like what Forrest Pritchard shared with me that day in the farmer's market. It was interesting, you, you know, you wrote about um, how following the Industrial Revolution, the notion of spiritual intimacy between land, creature and creator started to make 
less sense, yeah. It turned the land into an object to be managed instead of a relationship to be experienced. Now, if you think back, I mean, way, 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 way back, um, you know, what did people do with their lives? Mostly what people did was grow food in order to live. That's right. You know, that's a major occupation. Yeah, and um, you had to have... In that sense, you had to know intimately uh, both the sort of the weather, and so you had to understand what the sky was going to do, you know, what the, whether it was going to rain or be too hot. You had to be able to read sort of the environment that was all around you, and you had to know your land, and you had to understand water, um, because no one can really farm well unless you have some sort of deep intuitive and relation, relationship uh, with all the elements that go into growing food. And and um, I think our ancestors, uh, they just more naturally had the, that relationship because you're right, 90% of the people Lots who lived on the planet up until the 20th century had to grow their own food. <laughs> and so uh, things have really changed, you know, over the last 100 years. And that distance that we have, I think, has really um, – it's eroded our capacity to find God um, in the world around us, and 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 that yeah. that makes me sad. We have to have those eyes and that heart again, that can be in that relationship with the earth. I was intrigued also how you talk about how many churches are now operating farms on their land. Tell us yeah, about some of those. That is a a trend that I don't know how many people have written about it or how many people are aware of it, um, but a lot of congregations, you know, as congregations are getting smaller and uh, people really don't know what to do with these plots of land or these buildings that they have, a surprising number of congregations, I think it's about 700 congregations in the Episcopal Church alone in the United States, are now actually engaged in farming or gardening on a regular basis. And that includes both urban congregations, which are using, sometimes churches have the only sorts of plots of actual soil in urban environments um, because they will have had a church garden or they haven't sold all of their land to developers, you know, who fill the whole thing with condo buildings or whatever. <laughs> and so um, churches often have yards and um we're seeing that they're turning those yards into these little urban gardens where people can grow food and there can be, you know, some level of food provided in the summer for neighborhoods that are often food deserts. And that to me is incredibly, uh, that that's knitting together both a relationship with the earth and a relationship with your neighbor in order to do I justice. And, and yeah, then uh, – Urban or rural congregations are turning to farming as a way of developing a better financial base uh, to support their their buildings and their aging congregations. Mm. Well, I love the story about the Garden Church of San Pedro, California, where you said the church leaders are called cultivators and the church is outside. The church will be a community where the church is in the garden and the garden is the work of the church. I mean, this is, you know, Quite astonishing. And when we think about how many schools are now, um, you know, having gardens for the children to attend. So there seems to be this resurgence of interest and the reconnection to the land. And it, it's exciting um, because, of course, the better we treat the soil, that the soil with its health and well-being then actually processes nitrates better, and it is actually a way of minimizing the inappropriate kinds of carbons that are going into the sky and causing you know us to experience global climate change and global warming and so there's you know there's everything is connected, and there is a huge connection between the way we treat the soil and what goes up into the sky and how those things relate to one another. And there's a good number of people who are involved in um, farming movements who have made the case that if we can heal the soil, we can actually reclaim uh, clean air and we can re help at least to slightly rebalance uh, the way that the environment has gone out of control. So it's a, a beautiful thing 
that we get reconnected with the land, the land and the sky become reconnected, and it could be a path of at least some level of healing for this, you know, sort of terrible environmental mess that we're in right now. So that, to me, if we're talking about that definition of religion as religio, as connection, as binding, that is actually a demonstration or or a, a really, really great illustration of what I at least think that religion should be about about that reconnection. And um so so religio is about the connection and then spirituality is about us experiencing it and us being transformed by that connection. So so I that's that's me. I've always said for people for years I'm well, I guess I'm just religious and spiritual or spiritual and religious. Um which uh is a kind of a funny place to be cuz not that many people put them together, but I I'm trying. Well, I think, you know, you're right. People don't often put them together. And I think, you know, one of the reasons is because of that word religious. You know, I remember um, uh, an interview I did um, some years back when I was doing a series called Inside the Mind of God. And I was asking, you know, several people from different faiths and different, you know, cultures and different walks of life about, you know, their idea of God. And I spoke to... Um, a Lakota Sioux Native American called Teocasin Ghost Horse and they do not have a word for God and he said that when the you know the conquistadors came when the British came you know they every, the Indians were reviled because they were considered pagans they you know they did not know anything about religion and um, and uh, he said but you know our religion is all around us and oh, you know, that's the trees, so beautiful. The earth. Um, wow, we're at break already. You're listening to What Is Going On with Sandy Sedgefield, and I'm speaking with all the facts about dirt, earth, sky, ocean, and maybe the farmers' markets where the spiritual revolution is leaving many when they research this religion, the ultimate religion. We'll be back with more comments. Bringing a more conscious lifestyle to your world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Spiritual. Metaphysical. Green living. Psychic. Alternative healing. Life coaching. Do any of these or similar terms apply to your business or cause? If so, you are in a niche market with a very specific audience. Conscious Gate PR is the world's leading conscious public relations agency. With a global reach of over 4 million and growing, we offer comprehensive media campaigns to our targeted market. Learn more at ConsciousGatesPR.com. Conscious Marketing for Conscious Minds. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Diana Abbas, you've been described as a proponent of hopeful religion someone who champions a return to nature and an embrace of hospitality. In Grounded, you invite readers to join this emerging spiritual revolution to find a revitalized expression of faith and change the world. How hopeful are you that enough people will join this spiritual revolution to change the world in time? Well, oh gosh, you heard that sigh. Um, 
I was probably more hopeful than I have been uh, in the last year. I think that last year has been just really hard on on hope, um, sort of all together, because I think that in many ways uh, Western culture has sort of gone backwards. We've been so full of fear. You know, there's these huge fears of the other. I think there's um, a sort of a mentality of scarcity that's gripped um, Western societies, and everyone seems to be running for cover. You know, they want theirs, and they have to get everybody who's not just like them sort of out of the way. And that, to me, is really very depressing. But I've had to myself look for points of hope, things that I have thought in the past or experienced in the past that have given me um, hope. And I was, I was reminded of one of them this weekend. I was giving a, a workshop um, just recently, and I was talking about things that are going on with younger adults in the United States. And, and um, there's this one really amazing statistic is that younger millennials, American adults under 30, uh, 49% of them say, when they're offered this question, uh, that they have experienced a sense of awe and wonder about the universe in the previous week. And I look at that and I think to myself, and that's the highest of any of um, the American generations of adults. 49% of these young adults have this sense of awe and wonder about the world around them. And to me, awe and wonder, you know, that's that's almost like a doorway to hope. And that young adults, at least half of them, are 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 really they have that experience. And that experience is going to shape, you know, how they engage the earth and how they um encounter one another and how they encounter uh, the divine, how they encounter um, what they might call God in the future, and um, I think there's a lot of hope with with younger adults, and um, I, I'm always looking for ways in which I see young people uh, taking risks and acting not out of their own interests, but acting out of the ideas of abundance and the care for the earth and the care for communities that um, are not like them. And and there's a lot there to be very hopeful for. So I'm trying to keep my eyes off of the news, and I'm trying to keep my, my heart geared toward um, the people who who are acting out of love and compassion. And right now that takes a bit of extra effort, um, <laughs> but I think it takes a little extra effort from almost all of, all of us right now who might be feeling um, kind of weary uh, by the recent events. Well, you've kind of answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway in case you've got anything additional to offer. When I was telling a friend yesterday about today's show and about the book, their question was, so where do we find God in war, in ISIS, in Syria, in hurricanes and earthquakes? And and I'm not going to apologize for this one, but in a president that thinks throwing paper towels to beleaguered victims of a hurricane is an appropriate gesture. What advice would you give to people who feel that way? Yeah, the, God, God is not in acts of injustice, and God does not cause hurricanes to happen to people because they have disrespected the national anthem, which is something that Pat Robertson said this week. Um, and so so violence and suffering is not the nature of the of that which we call God. Some people call that God, some people call that compassion, some people call that, you know, the the sacred presence, whatever. Um that's that's not God. And so where is God in the midst of that? Or where is God when some lunatic kills 60 people on a, at a concert, you know. Um, the the best answer that I can have for any of those questions is that, that God is in the acts of compassion that occur in the midst of that, 
and God is in the, the 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 moments of gratitude that emerge even in the darkest and most surprising places. And you know, Elie Wiesel talked about that. How in even though he came not to believe necessarily in God in traditional Jewish ways during the Holocaust, he did believe in gratitude and he did believe in compassion. And he talked about how the only people that survived those camps were people that were able to see through the evil and find beauty and thanksgiving and appreciation and something that was beyond the suffering. And I think that the the evil of the days calls us to that. And I, I take a lot of, uh, of comfort from the theology written by um, Jews in the last half century because they, more than almost anybody else, have dealt with these questions. And their wisdom and the capacity in that theology to be able to say, hey, look, we don't even know if God really exists. We are just sort of trusting this. <laughs> this is what our ancestors said. But what we do know is we do know beauty. Even beauty at Auschwitz existed. And it was life. It was that life survived even that. And that's what Ellie Wiesel once said to Oprah Winfrey uh, when they got into a conversation like that. He said, if you could understand life and just be grateful for that, that is everything and so i i told him hold on to that. That good yeah really good answer you know there was a um a video going around on facebook in this past week and it was of a woman who had um survived the holocaust and she had been a twin and she had been operated on um and gone through so much i mean so much and come out of it all with a heart filled with forgiveness. I guess that's what it is. Oh, that's so amazing to me. And those are the kinds of stories I try to hold, I try to hold up for myself. Because people say that I, I'm a hopeful person, but I, you know, I, I, there's a wonderful story in the Old Testament about uh, about Balaam's ass. Which is, which means that when you say someone's Balaam's ass, that means they're accidentally um, something worthwhile. <laughs> it's a story of accidental worthwhileness. And so um, I always say to my friends, well, people say I'm hopeful, but I'm kind of the Balaam's ass of hope. <laughs> and that's because I have struggled so much with it in my own life that I have to learn to just keep chasing it down. And when I chase it down, it so surprises me that I turn around and I tell all my friends and I've learned to see it even when things seem hopeless. And so so I that's a, a gift that I happily share in the world right now because uh, we all we all need we all need hope. Yes, we do. You've just completed your what tenth book and it is on gratitude. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that before we close? Yeah, well, it's interesting that you would write it, ask me the question about Donald Trump um, because during the first 100 days of the Trump presidency, I had to get done a, a a book contract, and I had contracted to write a book on gratitude. And so every single morning I would wake up and I'd look at Twitter and I would watch Morning Joe and I would see all these hideous things, the front pages of the Washington Post, and then I had to come into my office and spend the next four or five, six hours writing about gratitude. And it was literally the most incredibly intense act of determination, grit, and sheer willpower that I have ever done in my entire life. And so I tell my friend that my friends say, how are you doing? And they said, you know, what, what book are you writing? And I said, well, I spent the first 100 days of the Trump presidency writing about about gratefulness. And the people's faces can't, are just hilarious. I mean, I wish I would take pictures of my friends' faces when I was telling them this. Because um, they said, how are you even doing that? And I said, well, because I kind of have to. And um, one of the things that I learned is that um, gratitude, be, 
gratitude is deeply related to grounded if we're connected to the earth and we're connected to one another and that we're we sense the presence the body of god as we're in the world around us everywhere all of a sudden gratitude opens up all around us that we can truly live um thankful lives and i discovered that thankfulness was one of the sort of spiritual practices not sort of, it was the spiritual practice that has gotten me through this last year, very unexpectedly. And I, I write about it. The book comes out in April, and um, I'm very excited about it. It was the hardest thing I've ever written, and it was the thing that taught me the most. Dan, about the best, we're out of time now. I really want to thank you. And you know, my own answer to that question about where we find God, I have to say, I don't get excited anymore about many books. But, you know, I would point to your book, Blended, as a place where people can find many, many, many examples of God. So thank you for writing that. I'm grateful. Oh, it's been wonderful talking with you, Sandy, and wonderful getting to know you through this process. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, too. Grounded, Finding God in the World, A Spiritual Revolution is published by Harper One. And if you want to know more, you can go to Diana Butler Bass's website, dianabutlerbass.com, where you can find all kinds of um, interviews, um, podcasts, discussion guides, etc. I'm Sandy Sitchfield. Thanks for joining me today. And I hope you'll join me again at the same time next week. So then, it's a good one for me.